Daniel chapter 5 this morning as we continue in our series on Daniel. I love the book of Daniel. I love Daniel. And uh, he, is what a, he is a tremendous testimony of God's grace and courage and fortitude for the Lord. All right, what a tremendous testimony that Daniel has, not only in the book of Daniel, but because of that, in our lives as well. Who doesn't know about Daniel and the lion's den? And we haven't even gotten there yet. Because of the book of Daniel, we know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. And of course, Daniel chapter 1, where the Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart. What a tremendous challenge for you and for I, just from Daniel. And we're now only to chapter number 5. There is so much, um, there's so much that we can learn from the book of Daniel and Daniel himself. I'm excited this morning because this is another familiar passage for us. Maybe not as familiar as Daniel and the lion's den. And Lord willing, we'll be there within probably six months. We'll get to Daniel and the lion's den. That's chapter six, in case you're wondering. And so eventually, uh, eventually we'll get there. Uh, but uh, oh, another tremendous story in Daniel chapter five, an account of the writing on the wall. Another great story for young people in Sunday school, but I believe another great story for us adults as well. And sometimes the, the familiar truths in the Bible are the ones that we miss, but sometimes it's those truths that we need the most. I hope we never get too old for uh, learning from Daniel and the lion's den, and I hope we never get too old or too sophisticated for for, that we don't learn from the writing on the wall. I want to tell you this morning that I want you not to miss what God wants to tell you. The history of that little phrase, writing on the wall, portends to this passage right here. And if you were to look up what the definition, the current definition of that phrase, that idiomatic phrase, the writing on the wall, it would say this. If you say that the writing is on the wall, you mean that there are clear signs that a situation is going to become very difficult or unpleasant, as defined from this account. And if you look on the internet, and I googled this multiple times, and went to multiple sites, they all have about the same idea. Because of Daniel chapter 5. The writing on the wall, all right, has entered our language because of the book of Daniel. And it means if you see the writing on the wall, then something bad is probably going to happen to you. That's the meaning of the phrase. Now, some out there will say, no, no, pastor, it's a good thing. Well, you can say that, just no one, ever, no one else agrees with you, okay? Uh, this particular account, the writing on the wall, was not a positive event for the king. Positive for God, positive for Daniel, but not for the people that the writing was going to. But why, why... Did this group of people, the king and the, and the lords and the, and the, the princesses and, and all these people, how did, they, how did they come to this spot that God had to miraculously write on the wall? It wasn't like all of a sudden Belshazzar the king from Daniel chapter 5 verse 1 woke up and all of a sudden God wrote on the wall. I believe there's some clear lessons for us from this account. Why did it have to come to this? Would, were there not ways to avoid this? Well, you know, at the end, when Daniel finally interprets the, the words on the wall that no one else could interpret, it was not good news. But it didn't have to be bad news. It didn't have to come to this. I think, naturally, all of us have a little bit of cynicism in us. A, a little bit of natural rejection of truth. Or let me explain it this way. I found this quote, and I, I think it's very uh, fitting for us. It, they went, it went this way. Why is it that someone tells you there are a billion stars in the universe, and you accept that, but if you see a wall with a wet paint sign, you have to touch it? Right? Raise your hand at home or here if you've been guilty of that. Yeah? We're guilty of that. I mentioned a few weeks ago the road close sign. And I can, I can believe the things from a telescope and from science, but, but you tell me something like that, and all of us have a little bit of, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Is it really as bad as they're really saying it is? Or can I beat the odds? Can I, can I be the one exception 
to the law of gravity. No, you can't. We all have a little bit of that inside of us. I was reading in preparation for this sermon about how there's this this, uh, event that people do. They try to capture a selfie, all right? And what a a selfish thing to do to capture a selfie from from the most dangerous or the highest point in a particular place. And in India, there's some very high towers. In Russia, same thing. And they'll show these people, and they were counting the deaths of people who have fallen... Because they're standing on top of a tower, holding on by one hand with one hand, and then taking a picture of themselves in the other in order to capture this elusive photograph. Passing all the signs of, don't proceed past this point, don't climb up here, it's dangerous. We all have a little bit of that, I'm different. I'm different. I don't have to do what everyone else does. I can, I can beat the odds. I can avoid the calamities by the choices that I make. And if we're not careful, we'll apply that same thought process to the Word of God. Even though God says what I'm supposed to do over here, I'm a little bit different. I don't have to follow what everyone else has to follow. I can do it my way and I can still have success. I don't have to follow God's word and the way to pattern my life. I can pattern it my own way and it will end up okay. Even though the Bible says wet paint, we say, and then we find out it's actually wet. Road closed, we find out it's actually closed. This will hurt and we find out it actually hurts. A few years back, we we're getting ready for a video for the church. We've done those in the past, those skip videos, and I, I have not done those as much now. I mean, you may have noticed I kind of pulled out of those, but for years at First Baptist Church, um, I did a lot of the, the skip videos, whether orchestrating them or being inside of them. I figured out early on, having come to First Baptist Church, that um, some people around here never got to play dress up growing up. And because of that, they decided to dress me up. I've been a number of different characters and things around First Baptist Church. I've been a hawk before. I've been a German police officer before. I have never been a woman before. I I do have some commitments in my life, and that is one of them. All right, I like the way God made me. All right, now, not all our staff feels that way, but just for me, that's how I roll. Well, it was during one of those videos that the the guys thought well it would be really cool if someone got tased (laughs) now some people have this desire in their life to wonder what will it be like to to be tased i've never had that desire i i've never i've never wondered all right i it can't be pleasant i've watched some of the videos before maybe you've done this on youtube it's not good all right, you watch and people are flopping, right? They're flopping or they're frozen like this. All right, that's not a pleasant sensation I can imagine. I like when my hands move and my arms move the right way. We're doing this video and, and um, one, of our, one of our friends from, from this wonderful place, the First Baptist Church, said, well, well Pastor J.D., we can, we can tase you if you want to. And we could record it. That would be really cool. Now, who defines cool? I'll tell you who does. Everybody else. Now, I have done a lot of stupidity in my life. I'm usually up for those adventures. This would be cool. I'll try it. Why not? But I didn't do it that day. Because inside of me, I know. I asked this question. I said, well, what happens when people get tased? This person responded, well, sometimes they swear. Well, why would they do that? Because it feels good? They cry? But none of this that makes me say, oh, this would be wonderful. All right, I realize that tasing is a way to control people that don't want to be controlled, right? To immobilize people who don't want to be immobilized. So why would I subject myself to this? But yet some of you will be like, I'd try it. It can't be that bad. Even though everyone else says, no, stop, don't do this. If we're not careful, we do the same thing to God's word. You have people all around you. I'm trying to bring God's word and say, wait, wait, stop. It is that bad. It is, that is a bad path you're going on. You say, I don't care about that. I'd like to see. I think it will be cool. I think it'll be fun. 
Don't miss the writing on the wall. In fact, don't even get to the place where you have to have writing on the wall. You see, we have a natural state of cynicism or unbelief. What we should know, sometimes we don't know. What we should do, sometimes we, we miss. There was a building on Chicago's southwest side about five years ago that went up in flames on a late Thursday night. It prompted a response, ultimately, of 150 firefighters. That is a tremendous number. Eventually, there was a portion of the building that collapsed under the intense flames. 26 pieces of equipment, fire trucks, 26 pieces of equipment showed up to fight this fire. To get water there, one firefighter said this, we had one engine, feed another engine to another engine until we got water to the fire. The odd thing about this particular fire is that the building that burned manufactured fire extinguishers. The building that was there to provide a means to put out fire had no means of itself to put out its own fire. And ultimately, the writing on the wall said they weren't prepared. Follow God and don't have the writing on the wall. Trust Christ today and avoid the writing on the wall. Read the words so you don't have to read the wall. Look at this morning, if you would, look in Daniel chapter 5, verse number 1 through 4, if you would. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessel, vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princess, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron, of wood and of stone. Lord, I thank you for this time we have. Lord, I pray you'd help us. Help us to see your word as truth. And our own volition, our own will, and our own way is false and error. Would your Holy Spirit touch us this morning? Lord, help me to say those things that would be helpful, that would be profitable. Lord, take your word and strike those places in our lives and hearts that are resistant to you. No, God, if there's someone who's listening this morning who doesn't know you as their Savior, would they trust you today? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I want to draw your attention this morning to just those first four verses. We have a tremendous feast going on. A time I put down of merriment. Belshazzar was the king. His father was Nebuchadnezzar. Up until this chapter, chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, we've learned just about Nebuchadnezzar. And now Nebuchadnezzar has slipped off the scene. Nebuchadnezzar, you remember, is the one that raided and besieged and set siege to Jerusalem. He is the one that brought Daniel back. He is the one that built the huge golden image. All right, he's that one, about 90 feet tall, that image was. He's the one that, that commanded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to go into the fiery furnace. He's the one that saw the fourth man in the fire as it was the Son of God. He is the one that went outside for seven years and was, uh, was lived like a beast until he repented. This is the king Nebuchadnezzar, and now we have his son, Belshazzar, on the scene. Belshazzar is uh, the king, the highest ruler in this extremely wealthy kingdom. And the Bible says that he made a great feast, a feast to a thousand of his lords. A thousand, at least a thousand person feast. Because along with his lords, his princes and concubines and his wives. They were having just a grand old time. And because of this, they began to drink wine, which we began to study already, alcohol in the Bible. This would not be a positive time. All right. And, and because of that, he had a grand idea. 
During the middle of this feast, he had a grand idea and he commanded while he's drinking the wine. He said, hey, 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 go get those special vessels. The, the, the ones that my dad brought back. You know, remember that place we, we, we raided Jerusalem? There was a temple there. It was a temple to Jehovah. And in that temple, my dad, Nebuchadnezzar the king at that time, had, had taken gold and silver vessels. If you remember from your Bible early on, these vessels were made as part of the worship of Jehovah. These were not just ordinary vessels. These were special, consecrated vessels fit for the master's worship, fit for worship to the God of the universe. These were vessels that were, were formed and fashioned with love and devotion to God. No doubt when they were forming these vessels of gold and silver, they knew their purpose. Read the Bible. They knew what was going on, and I, I can almost guarantee that as they formed them, they had that in mind. They were not carelessly fashioned. Right? They were carefully constructed, and they were carefully brought in the temple and consecrated to God. And, and Belshazzar, during this time of feast, says, hey, you know those vessels? This will be great. Go grab those as well. So someone runs off to the store's houses. To the storerooms, maybe another building, maybe in the bottom part of the, the castle, the kingdom, and brings these vessels back. Brings them back to a feast that Belshazzar had. Brings them back to over a thousand, to, a, to over a thousand of his lords, plus wives and concubines and princes, and Belshazzar himself. They take these vessels. They begin to drink from them, polluting them with the beverage of their feast. And they begin to, verse number four tells us, praise the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. Can you imagine that worship that they had for their false gods right then? Praising the gods of gold. I have on my, on my ring, I just took it off, a white gold ring. It's my wedding ring. It's precious to me. All right, it's a nice ring. It's precious to me for a couple of reasons. One, because it symbolizes marriage to my wife. Now, some of you men were going to say it symbolizes captivity, but I didn't go there now, did I? <laughs> I didn't go there, so don't put words in my mouth. But beyond that, this ring itself was designed by my wife. She got the plans for this, and she has a, a friend, we both have a friend, who designs jewelry and makes jewelry. A, a very uh, a very honored individual has, has won some, some tremendous awards in this, in, in national and international awards, um, has designed for Tiffany's. All right, so he's not, no, no slouch in the, in the jewelry designing business. Well, well renowned. And my wife designed this one. A couple years later, she didn't like it, so she added some, di added some diamonds to, to the inside of it. See, how much is it worth? It's cost me so much over the years, priceless. <laughs> but I, I love this ring. But I would never worship this ring. Right. Oh, great ring. Wow, how powerful you are. That's what they're doing. They're worshiping the gods of gold. Wow. Oh, great God of gold. You're such a pretty God. The gods of silver? Not quite as good as the gods of gold, right? Oh, second class gods of, of silver. You're not quite as good as the gold gods, but you're still pretty good. You brought us some silver vessels. The gods of iron? They can't even make it to silver. Oh, great gods of iron, you're so strong. Of wood? You can't be iron, silver, or gold. So now you worship the gods of, of wood? This pulpit here is made of, made of wood. It, it, wasn't, it doesn't illustrate a god. There's no god of wood. All those gods were made of wood, and the gods of stone... 
Listen, if you want to worship a God of stone, go outside, find a rock. Oh, great God of stone. This is what they were doing. They're drinking from the vessels that were given to God, and they were praising all these other gods. They said, oh, Pastor Howell, that's tremendous. Pastor Howell, I promise I will not worship a God of gold. Good. And you shouldn't. And you shouldn't. Can I just stop there for a moment, though? So I hope when you receive some of that stimulus money that your life didn't change and your attitude didn't change just because you got a little more money. Because if it did, oh, great God of stimulus money. Just as foolish, is it not? Now my problems are all set. Not because I have the God of the universe, but because I have a few more, a few more dollars in my bank account. God is still in control whether my bank account is full or whether it's empty. All right, you can't worship the God of the stimulus and, oh, my great hands, my, my job is back, so now life will be okay again. And, and I know that, that there are many people who have been laid off and are struggling financially. There's some real burdens there. Be careful that you don't just find your satisfaction and your worship in what is happening here because you'll be just as guilty as Belshazzar. Oh, great God of this money. Now my life is good. Now I've got it. Listen, my life is good whether I'm plumb broke or whether I'm infinitely wealthy. Why? Because I have God. Because my soul is destined for heaven forever with God. Not because I have lots of extra money in my bank account or because I don't have any money. That doesn't matter. God is all that matters. And Belshazzar and the thousands of, of the lords and the wives and the concubines and the princes, they missed it. Right. And if we're not careful, we'll miss it. Right. See, when our, when our truck runs, we're happy. Amen. When it's broken, we're sad. Oh, great God of the truck. My life is good. I have a good attitude because my truck runs. So now what dictates your attitude is whether your vehicle runs or not. You're worshiping a hunk of steel. It can't even be silver or gold. Belshazzar and his princes, Belshazzar and the lords, Belshazzar and the wise and the concubines were worshiping and missed the message. This gold vessel was created to worship the Creator. This silver chalice was dedicated for the one who dedicated himself to us and sent his own begotten son, Jesus Christ. You see what Belshazzar and the thousand lords and the princes did is they made life all about themselves. That's where the problem was. They said, look what I have, look what we did, look who we are, look at this extravagance that we have. Life was all about them until it wasn't. Life was all about them till it wasn't. You see, they sat there in that feast and they began to praise and say, oh, look what they've done for us. Life was all about them. Be careful when life becomes all about you. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. And in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Life all about yourself. Don't be the epicenter of your own universe. Don't live life in the light of yourself. You see, living life for yourself makes you and I a prime candidate for writing on the wall. The problem with most of, with most of our decisions... The problem with most of our decisions is that they're too safe, too sensible, and too self-centered. I like what Jesus told his earthly father and mother in Luke chapter 2. where he said, And he said to them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? This morning, I don't want you to get to the writing on the wall. It's never positive, but you don't have to. Don't make life about you. Make it about the Creator. Don't worship, the, uh, even mistakenly worship the things that are around us. Don't find your satisfaction, your fulfillment, your support, your safety, and what you have. Find it in your Savior. 
And the minute that we depend upon those things for our, for our attitude, all right, and our security, we have now begun to worship those things and they, and they are not lasting. They are just false gods. And Belshazzar had a feast of false gods. But this is where it's at until it wasn't. This morning, don't be like the building that burned down. You can know the truth, and the truth can make you to be free. Amen. This morning, you can turn to Jesus Christ. Yes. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for what you've given to us. Lord, I wonder, as I stand here and pray that those under the sound of my voice, I wonder if maybe there's someone this morning who would have put too much trust in something else. Lord, I know that there is turmoil, confusion, and change all around us. But Lord, I don't want to find my satisfaction, my security, in my bank account. I want to find it in my God. I wonder if you're at home today or here, maybe God touched your heart. and said, you've made life about you. You've been worshiping something else. You found your satisfaction over here rather than in me. Oh, my friend, would you put your trust in God? Could be you're a Christian. And God has said, you can trust me. You can trust him for the billion stars, but you, you question him on the wet paint sign. My friend, you can trust him. And you may be under the sound of my voice today, and maybe you don't know if you die that you'd go to heaven. Perhaps you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. My friend, God loves you. He loves you so much, the Bible says, that He sent His Son, His only begotten Son. His name was Jesus. For He shall save His people from their sins. The wages of sin is death. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one escapes that verse. The Bible says, I'm a sinner. The Bible says you're a sinner. Because of my sin, I don't deserve to go to heaven. I've come short of the glory of God. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, Jesus came to this earth. He, learned, he lived a perfect, sinless, and holy life. He is the Son of God. After he lived that life, they crucified him on the cross. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God, the wonderful, free gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friend today, if you've never trusted Christ, you can trust Him today. You can ask Him to save you, and He will save you from your sins. You can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says. And it finishes that verse, Thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I was a six-year-old in Sunday school. But I realized that I was a sinner. I deserve to pay for my own sin, but then if I ask Jesus to save me, he would. When I was six years old, I asked Jesus to save me. And from that day forward, I have been saved. If I die today, I know that I'd go live in heaven forever with God. Not because I'm a good person, but because God is a great God. My friend, today, you can have that same assurance. Sometimes when someone we're talking to you about this wants to pray they say well what do I say pastor now, the Bible teaches us it's not what we say it's what the heart believes to righteousness but with the mouth confession is made we sometimes lead in a simple prayer like this Lord I know I'm a sinner I know I deserve to pay for my sin but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and that he was buried in Rosie on the third day Please save me and take me to heaven. It's not in the magic words. It's in your heart. 
And my friend, if you could pray that today, from wherever you're at, at home, in your car, wherever you may be, if you've never trusted Christ, would you trust him today? Would you believe on him? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him. He'll hear you, wherever you're at. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, was buried and rose again. Please save me and take me to heaven. My friend, if you prayed that just now and meant that, the Bible says that Jesus saved you. Saved you. And if you did, we'd love to rejoice with you. I'd love to send you a book. You'll see a, a screen there with a phone number, an email address, and a website. If you would just jot us a quick note or leave us a quick message, I would be thrilled to send you a free book to help you grow as a Christian. Help your mind be focused on Jesus Christ. My friend, it's the best news we know. That's why the Bible calls it the gospel, the good news. Lord, I thank you for all you're doing here. Lord, I pray there's someone that has not trusted you, that they would trust you today. And Lord, if for Christians... May our minds, may our hearts not slide to something else, but find our satisfaction and worship in you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.